Good afternoon, everyone, or evening, wherever you are, and welcome to the 99th episode of Stories of Service, Ordinary People Who Do Extraordinary Work. And I am the host of Stories of Service, Teresa Carpenter. And today I have another outstanding, amazing guest, and actually the highest ranking guest I've ever had on the show, uh, Major General Retired Greg Martin. Sir, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. And uh, thank you very much, Teresa, for having me on. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, today is going to be a very special show. It is a show that will be focused on military service, uh, giving back, and mental health. And I will go ahead and introduce the show, give a little bit of descriptions about what we're going to talk about, and then we're just going to get right into the subject matter. So we're going to talk about um, bipolar disorder and some of the traits of bipolar disorder. And the very traits that made Major General Martin such an outstanding military leader his incredibly positive attitude, tireless, hyper-focus, it went too far. And he didn't realize his pension for intensity and thought, word, and action shifted into an abnormal range amid the chaos and, fo and fog of war. And But those around them did identify and witness these behaviors. You are going in and out of the screen a little bit. I don't know if you can see that. I don't know why. Um, but we'll, we'll just work through it because I know that I'll be able to hear you. Uh, there is a fine line between genius and madness, and Martin became intoxicated by war in ways he could no longer fully control. And I'm going to read you guys a little bit about him. Major General Greg Martin uh, retired, served on active duty for 36 years and commanded an engineering company, battalion, and the 130th Engineer Brigade in combat during the first year of the Iraqi war. He served in multiple overseas tours, commanded the Corps of Engineer Northwest Division, and was commanded of the Army Engineer School commanded Fort Leonard Wood and Deputy Commanding General of the 3rd Army, Army Central in the Middle East. He was also the commandant of the Army War Co College, and his last assignment, he was the president of the National Defense University. He holds a PhD and two master's degrees from MIT, master's degree in national security strategy from both the Army and Naval War College, and a bachelor's degree from West Point, uh, class of 1979, as we can see the ring right there. Uh, his latest book is called Bipolar General, but it's one of many books that he's written, but it's the book we're going to talk about today. And uh, first, right there, Bipolar General, and you can also see it in the background. And the first question that I'm going to get started with, and I always ask any of the guests who uh, have served in the military, uh, and many of my guests uh, do have military affiliation, I ask them uh, what inspired them to raise their right hand and join, uh, in your case, the United States Army. So I always knew from a young age that I wanted to serve in the military. My dad was a Navy sailor in World War II, and uh, all my uncles were in the military. So I knew this is something I want to do. Uh, I thought it would be really developmental. I'd you know, improve my education, travel, fun, adventure, all that stuff. And uh, But I also wanted to go to college. And so I found the perfect sweet spot between you know really good college and a price I could afford and go in the military. And that came in the form of West Point. So I, I learned about West Point. I got accepted, decided to go there. Didn't really like it at first, but I kind of did an attitude adjustment and you know embraced Mother Army and uh, had a wonderful four years at West Point. Then went out and served um, you know my initial five-year tour as a platoon leader and a company commander out in the field army in Germany during the Cold War, fell in love with leading soldiers, uh, you know, the challenge, the intensity of the army, loved it, and uh, never really looked back. And, you know, 30 plus years later, I was still in. <laughs> it's great. It's, it's such a, a story of just giving back and, and doing what you love for years and years and years. And you, you also served time in combat, didn't you, sir? Yes. Yeah, the main, you know, the big combat role... Uh, I think I lost you for a minute, but I think you're coming back. There you go. 2003 to 2004, you know, that was my main primary combat experience. Okay. Okay. Um, what would you say was probably your favorite tour in the army and why? I would say my favorite tour was commanding the 130th engineer brigade in combat in Iraq because it pulled together everything, everything I had done in the previous 20 years, all my training, education, experience, leadership, management, it all came together 
in this very challenging, intense mission to train for a war um, and then prepare for it and deploy to Kuwait then get ready in Kuwait with all the live fires and rehearsals and coordination, and then actually launch um, an invasion of a country, which I don't want to sound like a warmonger because I'm not. But I mean, I had trained for all those years to do exactly that. Mm -hmm. And we had the, the engineer brigade had an absolutely key, critical, pivotal role in the invasion, um, you know, essentially to make sure that all those heavy mechanized forces, all the tanks, and Bradleys and artillery and the trucks and everything could make it forward, cross the rivers and canals and get, get into Baghdad and accomplish the mission. So I, and I love leading soldiers in combat because it's great leading troops um, in peacetime. It's, it's rewarding, it's enjoyable, it's fun, it's challenging, but to, to lead them in combat is a whole nother experience. And so um, it, was, it was thrilling, uh, I was euphoric, um, it was, you know, important, dangerous stuff. And so I would say that was my number one assignment. That makes sense. And what's so interesting about you sharing that is that that number one assignment was also when you felt that you started to see the signs of, of the bipolar. Is that correct? I think you're there. Are you there? Yes. Okay. So I said, did you, I don't know if you missed my question. Uh, your screen is at least on my end. I don't know what the audience is seeing, but on my end and, and we'll work through it and just keep talking. But just so people know, it's sometimes going direct to me and then you're coming out and in, but we'll, we'll keep pressing on. I think, I think I've, I've had these technical problems a million times and they always find a way of resolving themselves. You, so uh, Teresa, do you want me to try to move to a different spot in my house and see if the connection's better? You could. Are you able to take me with you and us? Because we're, we're we're live right now, so I don't know if there's a way to do that. Where because if I if we get off this call, what will happen? Oh, nice. Okay, perfect. Because if what happens is if for those of you who do do live uh, podcasts, uh, you get off of a call, um, and what would happen is I would have to reset up this entire live stream elsewhere. So I, I try not to do that. Uh, so I appreciate your, your, your patience. There may be a part in your house that has a little bit of a better internet connection. And this is such an important conversation, as I was telling you guys earlier, um, uh, that I just want us to have the most time together that we can uh, to um, talk about. Okay. Okay. Um, I think it's going to be better here because I'm in a different position with regard to the, the Wi-Fi connection. So I think, it's, I think it'll be better. And um let me just adjust a couple of things. Yep. And I want to thank uh, our audience uh, for your patience through this process. Uh, going live is always, um, always unpredictable. And uh, we find ways to just work through the technical issues and the, those. And I think that, that the intimacy and the ability for people to chat with us in real time uh, often gives us the ability uh, to, to do these things and, and to kind of work through some of the bugs, but all right. So we'll go back to where my, my question was, which was, uh, during that time in combat, that's the most exhilarating, the most challenging. It's where the rubber meets the road. It's all those, tr that training and that peacetime work, it all culminates in those experiences. But what was interesting to me in your book is that that was also when you felt that you were starting to receive, uh, the symptoms of bipolar. Is that correct? Yes. Um, the VA and the Army Medical Department, they assessed that my actual onset of bipolar disorder was in the war in 2003. And so they, they basically traced my history. Um, and up, up till then, I, had, I, I was on the bipolar spectrum and I had a bipolar brain and I had uh, this condition called hyperthymia, which is a near continual state of low level mania. So I had that, but it wasn't real bipolar disorder until 2003, according to the experts. What were some of those early onset symptoms that they attribute to those two words that I don't think people really understand? Um, so once 
And it was a culmination of things. I mean, the intense train up and preparation in Germany where we were working, you know, tr tremendous hours uh, doing all kinds of things to get ready for the war. Then the deployment to Kuwait and then the training in Kuwait and then finally the attack. It was the culmination of all of that, the stress, the thrill, the euphoria that it triggered my genetic predisposition for bipolar disorder. So I, I already had the genetic predisposition, but it was that environment and the stress in particular that triggered it. And some of the immediate things were, when I went into mania were you know, suddenly my energy just shot up, uh, my enthusiasm shot up, my ability to see and understand the battlefield and make rapid decisions regarding complex prob multifaceted problems were just it was amazing um i felt like mm. go ahead uh, okay uh, go ahead again yeah you said i felt like superman you just you, you went out for just a second but you are better so yeah so i i uh you know i felt like superman i was all over the battlefield i i was i, I barely needed any sleep and so my mind was going faster and faster, but it was a productive mania. It, it wasn't a mania where I went insane or into madness like I did later in 2014. It was a, it was a mania that made me perform better and think more clearly and faster than I ever had in my life. Hmm. That's so interesting because there are people who are, are just going to say that their endorphins are running because they're, they're in the thick of the fight. And this is what probably makes bipolar so hard to uh, recognize. Cause we we've all heard of having a runner's high. We've all, and we've all um, been in those situations where we're sort of, you know, our, our, our senses are heightened because the stakes are high. And so I'm curious if, around you at the time, did anybody, nobody recognized what was going on? I, neither, and, and you didn't as well. Am, am I correct? Correct. Okay. And then, so this goes on. Um, that's when you think you first have it. And then when did it get, where did you see the first signs that it was turning into something that was, was not a productive high or not a productive mania? Mania the whole year in Iraq. And then when we redeployed to Germany, I fell into about a 10 month long depression. And I knew this is not good. There's something going on here because I'm usually full of energy and enthusiasm. And now I'm, I'm low energy, I'm confused, I, I'm withdrawn. And I went, to, I, I went to the doctor and I said, hey, there's something wrong. I feel like I'm depressed, which is very unusual for me. I, I'm never depressed. And they said, hey, you know, we talked and then they said, oh, you're fine. There's nothing wrong. Just, you know, you're good to go. Um, you know, just do what you're doing. And that happened two more times over the next several years. And each time I went in with depression, they said, you're fine. Um, but over the next, from 2004 to 14, um, my manic highs started getting higher and higher. My depressive lows started getting lower. My psychosis started getting stronger. And by 20, and, and again, it was all unknown, undetected, undiagnosed. Um, I didn't know there was anything wrong. Nobody around me apparently thought there was something wrong until about the spring and summer of 2014 when I went into what they call full-blown mania, where essentially I went into a state of madness or insanity. And, um, and it was at that point where people uh, recognized there's something wrong and they started writing anonymous reports up to my boss, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And, uh, and then he, so he got all these reports and he had known me for years. And, um, he, and, and the reports were like a textbook um, description of the symptoms of bipolar disorder, which I can I can go into and tell you what they were. Um, but he did an investigation, an assessment, and he came to the conclusion, um, you know, I've got to get Martin out of National Defense University or NDU, got to get him out for his good and the good of the school. And so it was, I, I got a call on a Friday afternoon. Uh, the chairman wants to see you on Monday. Oh, hi, on Mania. Yeah. You just you just went out again, so you got a call on Monday morning. The chairman wants to see you in his office, and then what happened? And so I didn't know whether I was going to get promoted, fired, or extended in command. 
But when I went to his office, the first person I saw was the lawyer. So I figured, well, uh, <laughs> probably not any promotion today. And, uh, and so he said, Greg, I love you like a brother. Uh, you've done an unbelievable job um, transforming NDU. Um, I give you a grade of A+, plus, but your time at NDU is over. Um, you have until 5 p.m. today to resign or I'm going to fire you. And oh, by the way, I'm ordering you to get a mental health exam at Walter Reed this week. And you would think I would have been disappointed. Instead, I said, thank you, General Dempsey. Um, you know, God put me here to do his work. And now he's going to put me somewhere else to do even bigger, better things. Mm -hmm. You know, the really weird thing is nine years later, from 2014 to now, I, I think I actually was right. I'm, I think that this bipolar work <laughs> doing is more important than what I did in the army. I agree with you 100%. It's way more important. And the thing that people don't understand about having delusions, because I'm, I'm thinking in my mind, the question that I want to ask, which is if you were having delusions, you were describing to people that you were having delusions, but in your mind, they weren't delusions. They, they sounded crazy, but in your mind, they weren't crazy. And so how did, how did people... Did, did they even know that the what you were describing was a delusion? Like when you would go to the psychiatrist and, 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 and describe things, did they just think that maybe you had grandiose thinking? Because a lot of people do. That's a personality trait of a lot of people is that, you know, that's how they get through things. I mean, I can't tell you how many bosses, admirals I've had who could, could fall or under grandiose thinking. And that's kind of how they get shit done. And so how are you able to not, to go under the radar so long on bipolar if you were describing the, the, the symptoms, especially the delusions and the paranoia? I think I stayed under the radar because number one, I didn't know there was anything wrong with me. And I was mostly manic. Mm -hmm. I had a sense of grandiosity where I thought I was on mission directly from God thought I was the smartest person in the world, thought I held the key to world peace, thought that if we transformed NDU the way that I and the chairman wanted to, that it would be like a, a global force for peace. And I, I believe this stuff passionately. And I could talk about it for hours. And I was very convincing. And I was funny. and uh, Right. And, and entertaining and life of the party. <laughs> yeah, I was life of the party. And, uh, and so... I didn't know there was anything wrong. And people would look at me and they, they, they would for years from about 2003 up till I went into full-blown mania when then people really knew, okay, there is something wrong. During that whole period, um, my success masked mm. the fact that I was having bipolar disorder, psychosis. So the, all people could see when they looked at Greg Martin was, wow, look at this guy. He's so successful. motivated. Motivated. <laughs> funny. I want to be on his team. He's a winner and he's got energy and he's really smart and he has a PhD from MIT. And so I was like, nobody could see through the mask. And plus I was a general and I was the commander. And so it just went kind of unrecognized. Mm -hmm. And plus people didn't know what the symptoms were. So looking back now, if someone were schooled on, hey, here are the symptoms of bipolar disorder, mania and depression. Here's what they are. Here's what to look for. It up much earlier had they known what they were looking at, but they didn't. Right. They didn't know what they were looking at. And and here is the other, you know, kind of the, the cruel joke about bipolar is that the very thing that is recognizable as mania is also the very thing that can make you the most effective or the most creative. And another part of this that isn't addressed uh, very often, and you addressed it towards the end of your book, is that let's just say there are all these people who are serving on active duty, who are deployed in, in, in dangerous places, and they have undiagnosed bipolar. If they get that diagnosis, what happens to them? Can they still do their job or are they med boarded and, and kicked out of the military? Well, that's a, and there's a lot of, you know, meat in the question you just asked. Um, first off, I believe that the numbers of people with bipolar disorder serving in the U.S. military is way, way higher than anybody recognizes or 
uh, the national average. The national average is about three to four percent have bipolar disorder. Okay, I just read it was from the National Institute of Mental Health that twenty five percent of veterans have bipolar disorder. Twenty five percent compared to three or four in the general population. Now that tells me you don't get to be a veteran unless you serve as a service member. So, so it must be something around, you know, 25%, you know, coming up. I don't think they suddenly, uh, I don't think they suddenly get bipolar disorder, um, you know, when they turn into a veteran. So the other thing that me think that there's a lot more bipolar disorder is, you know, I was unusual, late onset bipolar in my 40s. Um, but the, the age when bipolar typically strikes is 18 to 25. Well, that's exactly the same ages of people coming into the service. Um, the second thing is, um, most people don't know they have it, because it's, you know, the, ge- the genetic predisposition lies um, quiet, until there's a triggering event. And so tons of people are probably coming in who don't know they have bipolar, or if they do know, they lie about it on their enlistment papers so that they can come in. And then though, think about it, what happens the minute you get into the US military? High stress, training, deployments, et cetera. And so I think it's very high. My neighbor here in Cocoa Beach, Florida is a special forces guy. And he believes, after talking to me and reading, you know, my papers and everything, he believes that a huge percentage of special forces are bipolar, and it's their mania that carries them through all the danger and the you know the complexity of being a special forces guy that they couldn't they couldn't possibly do it without the superpower of mania. So, I don't know if that answered the question or if that's what I didn't get. No, no, it, it does absolutely answers the question. And it makes it so difficult too for if people people get the diagnosis, they're scared to get the diagnosis because if you get that diagnosis, uh, it, it most surely will trigger a med board. And if it triggers a med board, then you're not going to be able to deploy and you're not going to be able to do the things that you'd like to do uh, while you're still serving. And and my question to you would be, does everybody who who might have bipolar, do they need to be on medication? Are there other ways that you've heard for people to manage bipolar? Because as I've shared with you, and I don't mind sharing with my own audience, I had what I do believe was a, you know, a psych- I did have a psychotic episode and I, and I may or may not have untreated bipolar disorder. And it, one of those things though, where I'm, I don't really feel safe or comfortable going to a doctor about it and getting put on medication if it would trigger a med board and not give me the ability to go to my next very high profile fleet job that I will announce at a later time. So at this point in my career, what, what, what does somebody do who thinks that they might have uh, bipolar, but wants to continue to serve? Wonderful question. Um, you know, one, one thing before I get, I, I didn't answer from the last question is if uh, people have bipolar Types of if people bipolar. have bipolar disorder, you, you went out again, but we're going to keep going. Um, if people have bipolar disorder. Um, there's bipolar one, which includes significant mania and depression, but, but the significant mania, that's bipolar one. Bipolar two is a low level of mania called hypomania and lots of depression. And just in the last couple months, I've had about a half a dozen friends, people that are in this little network I have called the Mental Wellness Warriors, about a half a dozen of them who have bipolar type two, um, they got their security clearance uh, continued, they reported it, it got, they're on medication, they see a psychiatrist, it got continued. Because bipolar two is considered not that dangerous where bipolar one with the, you know, the potential full-blown mania is considered a real risk. Um, you know, and I think back to when I was in full-blown mania, I was a risk. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I mean, I could have, you know, killed people. I could have done all kinds of crazy things and being around weapons and classified material and so forth was not a good idea. But you may, if you have bipolar type two, you probably are going to be okay and continue to serve. At least that's what I've seen in the last several months. Um, Your question of um, if you have bipolar disorder, can you, what should you do? Um, I would say first thing, um, go get checked out 
Now, whether you want to do it in the civilian world so that it's, you know, hidden from the military, um, you know, that's really a personal decision. Probably smart if you're, you know, worried about continuing your career and all that. Um, you know, I'm not advocating that, but it, but it makes total sense. And I also know a lot of people that have done that with bipolar disorder, depression, and other mental conditions. Sure. I've heard about that as well. Yep. And then, and then the, uh, the, the next thing, well, but I would say it's really critical if you think there's a, an issue to go get checked out by a medical professional because bipolar disorder and other mental illnesses are potentially deadly. I mean, they can kill you. Um, left untreated, they can, you know, they ruin, you know, marriages, careers, families, lead to addiction, homelessness, incarceration, death, suicide. I mean, that's very, very real. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, but if you do get treated, you can live a happy, healthy, you know, purposeful life. So then the question is, well, what about people who are being treated? Can they do it without the standard, uh, pharmacology? Medicine? Right. Can they do it without lithium? Can they use other, other, other methodologies or other healing pathologies? I've heard that there are people who are doing that. And you see stuff from time to time, you know, on social media or in the news or whatever. Um, I, you know, I believe from what I've heard, there are ways to do that, but you would have to find the right doctor, you know, the right, you know, the right mm -hmm. approach. And I don't know what that is. I just know lithium saved me, saved my life. And so I'm sticking with it, even though it does have some risks of, it, of its own. Right. And, and we, in your book, you address a lot of those risks. Um, you, you, the, the, the tremors you, you address the weight gain. Um, and, and every pharmaceutical is, is going to have certain side effects, but like you said, uh, you haven't had an episode, you haven't had, did, do you no longer have, do you ever miss the extreme highs and the creativity and the, and the, those, that that's the part that I think maybe some people are concerned about too, is, 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 do you lose any part of your personality or any part of the way you used to be that you miss? A little bit uh, sometimes because, you know, my whole life I was high on dopamine. I mean, my whole life from high school on and it drove my success and I felt great. I was high and up and positive every single day. And, um, and you know, like as an army officer, every day was, you know, fun being around the soldiers and, you know, just dealing with, you know, all these people. It just was a complete high. In fact, a couple of the doctors have told me that the high from dopamine and endorphins is way, way higher. They said 17 times higher. I don't know where they came up with the number, but it's significantly higher than cocaine or ecstasy or any of those, you know, man-made drugs. And so uh, in my mind was just operating so fast, so clearly and could accomplish huge things that, yeah, I, uh, I kind of miss it. Um, it was fun. But the, on the other side of the coin, the depression was so horrible. I can't overemphasize how awful the depression was. I mean, lost interest in everything. I wanted to die, had passive suicidal ideations. Everything was awful. And I mean, I was in you know, what I call bipolar hell. But mm -hmm. so I know that if I was ever to come off the meds, I'd probably go into mania again. And what goes up must come down. And so it's guaranteed I'm going back into depression and I don't want to ever go there again. I, I would rather trade off. I'll give up the main manic high mm -hmm. to avoid the depressive low. And plus um, these relapses can be much more serious than the original onset. So if, if I had, if I had a reset of, or a relapse of bipolar, it might be significantly worse than I went than what I already went through. And I feel like I owe it to my wife, my family, my friends, myself, to really stay healthy and stay, stay on the railroad tracks, stay inside the white. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. What? Yeah. So now let's kind of get into your own story and, and, and how you decided to share this story, because so many people would have had something like this happen to them and they would have just sort of ridden off into the sunset. They would have gotten the help that they needed, but they would not have necessarily shared it on such a, as large a platform as you have. I mean, you've got the book, you're doing all these podcasts, you're doing so much to, 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 to talk about this issue. So 
when did the when did that idea get started and how did that come about? Well, um, the day that I got diagnosed, you know, Veterans Day 2014 at Walter Reed, I thanked the doctor. Um, remember, I was in terrible depression with psychosis. The mania had long since passed. And I thanked him and I said, hey, doctor, I really appreciate this. I knew there was something wrong. I didn't know what it was, but now you put a label on it and I can you know, focus in working with you and other medical professionals and try to you know, get recovered. And so it was actually right after I got home, I decided I'm, I'm not gonna hide this. I'm gonna tell people, hey, I just got diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And so I did, I started telling people um, you know, sort of right away. And then it, it stayed at a very low, unobtrusive level for a while until I, you know, I, I kept being honest about it. But then after I moved to Florida and began my journey of recovery seven years ago, um, I started telling all the new people I met in Cocoa Beach, Florida, I'd say, hey, um, it, it, I have bipolar disorder. And, uh, you know, would you be a friend and a battle buddy? Here's the symptoms. And I gave it to him on a card. And if you see me acting in any of these ways, please tell me and my wife so we can, you know, take action. And so then people are like, hey, you know, Martino, that's my nickname. They say, Martino, you have to write this in an article. You got to talk about it. This is so important. And yeah. so I did. I talked, I spoke at the Rotary Club and a church group and then a retreat and yeah. little by little. And then I decided, OK, I'm the positive. The reaction was so positive. I said, I'm going to write a book. And so it took me a year I wrote typed every day for a year and I got the manuscript done. And then it took another year to find a publisher and another year to actually get it published. But during that whole time, once I finished the manuscript, I started writing articles. So I've got about 20 articles published. They're all on my mm -hmm. website. And then I, I've probably done about 60 or 70 talks, podcasts, interviews. Many of them are on the website. And then now with the book coming out, um, you know, the, the dam has broke. I mean, mm -hmm. people want to get a hold of me and, you know, I, I, you know, I'm doing lots of podcasts, lots of interviews, lots of talks. Um, so it's, it's really, it's a lot of fun and it's very rewarding and it's really taken on a life of its own where, um, you know, I believe that, you know, this is my pur my purpose in life now, as I, as I sort of started recovering from, you know, the worst of it, my purpose is sharing my bipolar story to help stop the stigma, promote recovery and save lives. And, you know, that's what I do. So talk, having this uh, conversation with you, Teresa, that's, this is just a perfect example of, you know, what I do. I, earlier today, I spoke to a, v, a VA hospital, all the people there. Um, and so, I mean, this is my job, my Your mission, my mission. And, uh, and I do it by speaking, writing, conferring. Mm -hmm. I, I really wanted to, to narrow down on one part of this that I think is the most shameful for people to talk about, because you're the first person who's ever said it on a piece of paper, what, what, what I experienced back in 1998, 99. Can you put a fine point, if you don't mind, on what exactly you meant by paranoia and delusions? Well, um, those are the components of psychosis. And what, um, you know, paranoia is, I th it's thinking the worst that people are, people are out to get you, that they're plotting against you. And typically, and you said this earlier in our conversation, it's in, in every single case that it's happened to me, there is a An element of truth. Little kernel of little tiny, little tiny bit, and then what the paranoid delusion does, what the brain does, yes, you got it. It brings it out, and it becomes the thing you obsess and ruminate over. And I understand. Then, and then, so the thing about a delusion is, a delusion means you fervently believe something to be true that is in fact not true. Yes. And, yes. and that's what happens with the paranoid delusions, you know, and it could be somebody made a comment, somebody gave you a look, somebody, you know, you heard that somebody said something and then it just blows up in your mind and you just begin to totally believe it. A, a hallucination is different. A, a hallucination is where the brain sees, hears, feels, smells 
something that in fact does not exist. But, and I had hallucinations of flying, of seeing the Holy Spirit, of seeing devils and demons, of seeing people's faces morph into rats and snakes, to seeing people morph into Saddam Fedayeen, guerrilla fighters from Iraq. Um, you know, and, and those were hallucinations, which in the brain were real, but in, in you know, they, but they really weren't real. Were you telling people about those while they were happening? No, I didn't tell anybody about them. Did you know, why did you know not to do that? Was it because you were ashamed or was it just because you, you just knew in your mind that that's something you're not supposed to say to people? I think the paranoid delusions where I thought people were out to get me, I just thought I'm going to, I'm just going to kind of lay low with this. I'm not going to, you know, up the ante. I'm not going to accuse people of plotting against me and I'm going to just hope that everything stays okay, stays smooth, stays calm, and we can just kind of, you know, glide, you know, glide out mm -hmm. of it. And, um, and, you know, that's pretty much what I did. So I never, I, at least I can't recall confronting people and saying, hey, I think you're plotting against me. But but thinking that like, like in my case when I had my my delusions, the first time I've ever talked about this on a show, but I would think that like God was talking to me and then I would read, I would look at somebody and think I could read their thoughts. And I would in my mind have a story that I was saying, like, this is what these people are thinking. I've got superpowers. And I thought I did. I thought I was psychic and could read the thoughts of others. And the only way that they knew to say that I was having delusions was I started telling a psychiatrist, you know, the people at the medical clinic in Keflavik, Iceland, where I was stationed, what I was, what my powers were able to do. And I'm curious when you said you did not get diagnosed all those years uh, when you were seeing psychologists, if you had described that, the, the, the seeing devils and things like that, would they have recognized it or would they have still just blown it off? I think I said, if, if I had gone in and, and described some of these psychotic episodes, mm -hmm. I think that might have really um, alerted them. Where, whereas, you know, when I went in with depression, they, they just said, oh, you know, th this guy's a general. He's got a hard job. He's under a lot of stress, you know, but, he, he, but he's OK. He's got me ways to deal with his depression, which I did. And they like my ways. But, um, you know, I would like do like, in, you know, really intense exercise. I'd listen to really intense, happy rock and roll music. I would mm -hmm. like recite these key power verses from the Bible. Uh, and then if that and I go like for a really fast run and do wind sprints. And then um, if that didn't work after duty, I would drink, you know, lots of alcohol. And uh, and so I told them that. And so they seemed to think I was OK, that my you know coping mechanisms were were good. <laughs> and uh, but I think if I would have said I have these psychotic things and I saw people turn into Iraqi guerrilla fighters and things like that, or I saw mm -hmm. devils, they would have said, whoa, you know, hey, you know, <laughs> we need to spend some more time with you. But I never did. I didn't tell anybody any of those things because I thought they were real and I just didn't have any urge to share that with anybody because I thought I was the smartest guy in the world and that this was, I was what I was experiencing because I was God's agent in the Department of Defense. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, after my episode, I, I didn't share it with anyone. I I, I immediately just covered it up. I, I was so much to the point where I destroyed all my medical records of, of, of the treatment. I don't, I mean, I don't know anything ever will exist for, from 1998 when this happened because um, I was so ashamed and I wanted everybody to just think I was fine. I wanted to be off all medications and I wanted to never talk about it ever again. And I didn't address it until some of the stigma about mental health started to lift. Um, so that's why I just, I applaud you so much for having the courage to, to, to go over these kinds of things because people don't talk about them. And, uh, this is why, uh, I think a lot of times this stuff does, uh, go, go untreated. So. I want to transition uh, to a little bit about how you're dealing with life today, other than the medication. Um, in your book, you, you talk about something called the five P's, and I'd like to talk more about some of the ways that you you have dis, you have kind of taken a more holistic view of of life uh, since this has happened. 
Yes. So I think the key to, to recovery and to maintaining and managing the bipolar so that, you know, one lives a healthy life are, you know, number one, getting the biochemistry in the brain in proper balance. And I, you know, I think there's different ways to do that. For me, it's, it's the medication. Um, and I, t for my, for the bipolar, I take lithium. That's the primary. And Latuda. Um, number two, I think therapy is really important. You know, you know, talking to another human being who is a trained expert in how the mind works. You know, and, and a lot. I've got a PhD psychologist at the VA who I talk with, and she's very helpful. Third is healthful living. You know, and it's typical healthy living. You know, uh, a healthy diet. You know, plenty of exercise, plenty of sleep. You know, getting the eight hours of sleep drink plenty of water, low stress, et cetera, all those kinds of things. And those are all necessary, but they're not sufficient for a, for a recovery and for managing a mental illness. You have to take them and anchor them into what I call the social platform of the five Ps. And the five Ps are first people, having, being around happy, energetic, fun people, which I have in spades in Cocoa Beach. Like my best friends are, you know, in the dancing group and at the gym and, you know, we Love just it. karaoke. So it's like, you know, it's fun and people are happy. And so I think, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the second thing is purpose. I mean, finding and crafting a purpose is absolutely critical. And what I found is seven years ago when we moved to Cocoa Beach and I started lithium and started to recover is I didn't have a purpose. I didn't have a mission. You know, and as a military person, the first thing you ask when you come in the door is what's the mission? You know, once you have a mission, you can mm -hmm. focus, apply resources and move forward in that direction. And it took me a couple of years until I finally realized that my mission was staring me in the face and was right inside my own brain. And, and that's when I came up with the idea of, you know, sharing my bipolar story to help stop the stigma and save lives. And so then reading, I mean, writing, speaking and conferring. And so the, the purpose is huge. Uh, oh, third thing. Third one. Is, yeah, third thing. Uh, third is place. I think it's really critical to live in a place that makes you happy energizes you and allows you to do the things you want to do. And for me, the big move for my wife, Maggie, and I was to move to Cocoa Beach for the sunshine, the warmth, the brightness of Florida, which really has positive effects on the brain scientifically. It does. The fourth P is perseverance because recovery, well, life's not easy to begin with, but recovery from a mental illness is hard way. And it's critical that you never give up, that you have the will to win and you keep fighting. And if you get knocked down, you get back up and you keep moving forward. So perseverance is key. And then the last one I call, uh, my son actually came up with this one. He, he called it presence. And presence is being able to get outside of your own head and to think about your own thinking. And the fancy word for that is called metacognition thinking about your own thinking. And, um, you know, and the reason that's important is a lot of times what's in our own head, our own thoughts are incorrect. They're wrong. Yeah. And like, I'll just give you an example. Like we talked about my terrible uh, paranoid delusions in earlier years, but even today I'll get little seedlings, little seedlings of paranoid yeah. delusion and, and they, they kind of pop up and I say, wait a second, you yeah. know. Question it. Yeah. It's not real. And, mm -hmm. and then I, and I can quickly come to the conclusion that those people, they're not only not thinking bad about you, they're not thinking about you at all. <laughs> they don't care. <laughs> <laughs> they got better things to do than think about you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the five Ps. Oh my God. I love it, Greg. I love it. Oh my gosh. I, I'm... Ah, this conversation is, is definitely hitting me on like such a visceral level because I, I've, I've struggled with so many of the things that you're, that you're talking about. And in fact, I'm, I'm, um, Florida is, is also in my future. Uh, can't say more than that, but, uh, 
Yes. So everything that you're saying is, is, is just, is just hitting me and I'm hoping it's hitting all of you. I see so many comments here. A few people have been weighing in. Uh, Dr. June uh, Brenner says, Whoa, what a great attitude, sir. Um, she, she had been putting a few other uh, comments in here as we were talking. Uh, Austin Ives, you had already answered this question, but he, she said, he said, Greg, great to see you again. Did you want to be treated and potentially give up your superpower? And we, we addressed that a little bit. And he says he has difficulty giving up his. And that was that's my concern, too, about about getting treated uh, for bipolar, too. But it, it's interesting because, I you know, I still am seeing a psychiatrist and I'm definitely going to mention it uh, next time I visit because uh, I, I definitely want to explore this issue further. Um, and I hope this inspires people who are watching this show uh, to understand that this is a thing. This is not uh, something that's made up. This is not something that's caused by trauma. Um, I, I also let's let's talk. Let's run through that, too. Did you have any um, trauma in your past or did you ever think that some of what was happening you could ascribe to trauma, even if it was the trauma of war? How did you separate the brain being unhealthy to something that was a traumatic experience? Um, I don't think I had any real trauma, um, you know, growing up. I mean, I had a great family, no, no trauma, no trauma, no abuse. Um, I think, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that they now talk about this idea of a bipolar spectrum, that mm -hmm. it, you don't just flip a switch and you go from no bipolar to suddenly you have bipolar. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. You're, you're on a spectrum. And I was on this spectrum from my teenage years on. And in other words, I had a bipolar brain that was, you know, preconditioned to go into real bipolar. Um, I, I think as I went up the ranks and, you know, my achievements, like just as an just an example, like when I was a junior officer, um, you know, worked unbelievable hours, ran four miles in from a farm to work, worked like a madman all day, ran home, worked on a farm, you know, ran seven marathons under three hours, including a 236, you know, would drive on a Friday night, would drive from Germany, you know, down into Austria. And, and then, you know, drive all the way back, you know, no sleep, get up, do PT, work again the week, go down. And I mean, I was just like constantly on the go. When I, the army sent me to grad school, they said, get one master's degree in engineering. And I got two plus a PhD. And so these are all elements of this bipolar brain. That's the reason I did those things was my bipolar brain elevated my talents. Um, but I will say that um, as I started, once I got to a, a little bit later in my career, I think battalion command where you're in charge of about 500 soldiers and you're a lieutenant colonel or the rank of commander in the Navy or Coast Guard, that was a level of intensity and responsibility, you know, to have these 500 soldiers plus their families, big combat mission, you have to be ready to deploy worldwide, fight, win, bring everybody home with, you know, all their body parts. And uh, I think the intensity of that experience rapidly, I think it took me rapidly up the bipolar spectrum and got me to a sub bipolar level so that then the next thing was brigade command in Iraq. And then I went over the threshold and, you know, went into, you know, true bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, I think what I'm hearing is that it's sort of a combination of both. Like your brain has to be pre, pre um, has to have the predisposition for it or it runs in the family um, in a lot of cases, but then there also needs to be some sort of a stressor or a trigger or a trauma that will exasperate uh, those issues. And so, um, yeah, Eric Duckworth, thank you uh, so much for, for uh, joining us. And he says, um, yeah, he says, in the indoctrination, um, he says, we focus on combat trauma, but it's the indoctrination that makes us hyper vigilant and anxious. And again, yes, the, the, the ways in which we were put into stressful situations within the military. And then uh, David uh, Kako says, salute to General Martin for being so transparent and forthcoming. Um, absolutely. It really is this, this sort of strange combination of a many things that I think uh, come together when people have this uh, disorder. And I guess my, my next question is, have you spoken to others who are impacted by bipolar, bipolar and do they share similar stories about some of the symptoms like the delusions, the paranoia, the highs and the lows? Yes. 
they have. And, um, you know, by communicating and, and doing these articles and now the book and then all these podcasts and interviews, I mean, I've had hundreds and hundreds of people reach out to me, you know, primarily on, um, they go through my website and send me an email. Um, and we've had, you know, hundreds of discussions. I've, I've had for two plus years now, this really cool group called the Mental Wellness Warriors, who are people who reached out to me and most of them have a mental illness, but they, we get together once a, uh, once a month and somebody in the group or we bring in an outside person gives a little presentation informal. It's not recorded, but they give a little presentation mm -hmm. for, you know, 20, 30 minutes. And then we have a discussion and that group has become a network. It's, it's really become an expanded peer support network. Some of my best friends, Teresa, I mean, I love some so people. Cool. And I saw Austin Ives was on there. Austin and Steve Chamberlain, two great Coast Guard officers, they presented uh, last week and they were fantastic talking about the, the trauma and the stress being a Coast Guard uh, guardsman. And then, you know, now as retired captains, they are leaders in helping the Coast Guard deal with this significant challenge. And um, and sorry about that. And, oh, no worries. Uh, and so, uh, and, and, and they've got a really innovative program where they're teaching and they're getting the Coast Guard Relief Fund to pay for it and all that stuff. But I mean, it's, it's so interesting. I have, you know, some of my best friends have, you know, they're multiple suicide survivors, been, you know, hospitalized 10 times. And they're the most wonderful people in the world. They're so giving and smart and friendly and fun, but they're just tortured by this mental illness. So, so anyway, yeah, that's a long answer to talking to a lot of people. Um, one of the most rewarding and surprising things, I've actually been a keynote speaker at three significant prestigious uh, professional medical association conferences in the last year. And, and the one most recently was um, the International um, uh, Society of Bipolar Disorders, which is really the leading body for research and science in bipolar. And they had their global conference in Chicago. And I was a keynote speaker plus a panelist. And I met, I've met dozens and dozens of doctors and scientists who are now asking me to come speak to their college or university or, you know, give a talk or do, do this or that. Mm -hmm. And the most encouraging one is University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, one of the professors there who's a, you know, a world expert on bipolar disorder, she has already taken pieces of the book and is teaching them to her med school students mm -hmm. in psychiatry. Um, she had me come in as a guest lecturer. I did it by Zoom, but I, I was the guest lecturer to a classroom full of med students who were going to be psychiatrists. She lined up a podcast at the university um, TV channel. In, in two weeks, we're going to do a, a podcast together. So her, the expert psychiatrist, me, the, you know, they call expert by lived experience. So th that medical conference I went to has produced, I mean, a huge snowball effect. And, and, sure. and so, I, so anyway, the short answer is yes, lots of contact. I love it. I absolutely love it. It's so affirming uh, to hear your story uh, and to know that this is something that people can get help for. Uh, they're, they're not alone. Uh, they can, are people able to join your mental wellness warriors uh, club? Is that something open or, I mean, and if it's not, that's okay too. Maybe there's other, there's other clubs and other ways that people can get involved it's, and join. It's, it's totally completely open. And okay. just, you know, if, if, if anybody, you know, is interested or wants to do it, just send me a note. The easiest way to do that is just go to the website, general dot com. That's the easiest way. Just send me a note and, um, you know, and, and, and you don't have to have a mental illness to be in the group. Even I, I would say over half do, but you know, a lot of people, you know, have a perfectly healthy brain with, you know, nothing, nothing at all, you know, bothering them. And they, they're great too. I absolutely love it. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Coral, uh, I know you're going to, 
Um, I bet you'll cross paths with her at some point. She writes, this is an absolutely well done and fascinating conversation. You both are heroes of courage. Uh, she does a webinar also uh, where people share their stories of service. And she says, some of the most amazing people I have met are so warm and loving. At a suicide loss group that I visited a couple uh, nights ago, the majority of loss uh, was due to bipolar. Most of the ages were 20s and 30s. And she was describing about your experiences at the conferences. This is the way to elicit empathy for our clinicians and scientists, the power of your story. And then she put, um, I'm looking forward to checking out the group. I want to understand this more and know people with the diagnosis. So I have a feeling you'll hear from Sarah at some point. Uh, she has an amazing show called The Power of Our Story. Uh, I've been on it. So many others have been on it. And uh, I definitely hope that our conversation today will inspire other people uh, to, to reach out to you. I know you're probably getting hit up a lot, but uh, this is your mission now. And I'm so happy for you and your family. And that's another thing, too. I want to just plug your book uh, even more. For one, it's incredibly well written, uh, very well organized. It's He's probably going to go grab it as I'm starting to talk about it. But it has so many different vignettes it's chronological it, it it doesn't it doesn't mince words you're such a good writer greg and it describes things in such intimate detail i mean i read that whole book from cover to cover and then i intentionally kind of took it like a fine wine and wanted to make sure that i had it right in my mind as we did the show and so i made sure to kind of finish it you know right right around now and it's so good. And you even do testimonials in the end with your wife and, and, and your friends and what they were observing. And so there was so much research that was done into the book as well, which I really appreciated. So um, just, just like I said, thank you for, for everything that you've done uh, to, you know, to, 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 to bring awareness to this issue. Um, we're getting at the top of the hour. Um, is there anything that I have not addressed that you'd like to address with our audience? Um, just one one quick hello to Sarah Carell, and I'm going to be on her show in November. So, Sarah, <laughs> great work. Love you. Um, I would just say that, you know, mental illness is dead, potentially deadly. And But the good news is, is that if you get the right treatment and you manage it the way you would manage any other chronic disease, you can live a happy, healthy, purposeful life. Um, and you know, the whole reason people don't, the big reason why people don't go get help is because of stigma. And stigma is based in pure ignorance. It's, it's you know, people are embarrassed, they're ashamed, they don't get help because of the stigma. And the stigma makes no sense. People blame the afflicted. They say it's because you don't have enough character that, you know, it's your fault that you have a mm -hmm. mental and that makes no sense because it's physiologically real inside of the wiring of the brain. It's just that it's invisible. And it's just as physically real as cancer, heart disease, or um, diabetes. And nobody stigmatizes those diseases. And the other thing I would say is that, you know, when someone, when you see, you know, people with the warrior spirit uh, trying to come back from mental illness, you should look, you should consider them, uh, you know, like a, a heroic um, a heroic person, just like a woman battling breast cancer, which back 50 years ago used to be considered stigmatized, embarrassing, until Betty Ford told her story. And today, um, women battling breast cancer are, it's a heroic fight. And even the NFL football players wear pink shoes during uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So it, mental, aware, mental, the awareness of you know, the struggles in mental health and battling mental illness, I think, need to be recognized and normalized and put on the same basis as fitness. Yeah, and put on the same basis as, as, as physical health. And I will say that that is also your mission. Your mission is not just about bipolar, but it is about erasing the stigma of, of mental health uh, altogether. And so, with that, I just, I want to thank you so much, Greg. Um, you, this has been just a, a fantastic conversation. Um, I hope it's been healing for a lot of people. I know it's been healing uh, for me. Um, I'm going to go full screen uh, here in just a second. I thank you all to for some of the technical detail um, issues that we had. I think we got through them just fine and, and had a, an amazing conversation. So Greg, uh, with that, I'm going to go full screen, but thank you so much. Uh, and I'll meet you backstage just to say goodbye real fast. But thank you so much for coming on the Story of Service podcast. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on. 
Awesome. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, this has been an incredible conversation and it is something that is near and dear uh, to my heart. So, so thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to come on to the show. I do want to thank uh, my husband and all those who are watching, uh, who continue to support me and this project. This is a passion of mine uh, that I hope will continue for quite a long time. And with that, uh, I will see you all next week. I'm going to have a young uh, influencer who's a member of the Marine bobsled team next week. So that will be a very exciting uh, conversation. So please join me and uh, please stay tuned. I'll be giving you guys more details about it uh, in the coming days. And with that, thank you so much. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your day and bye-bye now.